It all blends together, bro. It all blends together. People will be like, think I'm not a competent person because I don't know what day of the week it is. I've seen it. I remember being like, you know, enjoy your weekend to a table. And it was like Tuesday. And they were mm-hmm. like, this guy's an idiot. <laughs> like, it was such you a. might be a little drunk. Yeah, right. It wasn't like mm-hmm. funny to them at all. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But Yeah. Uh, our being on that service industry schedule definitely throws off your what you consider to be a weekend and a Saturday. Yeah. It's like Saturdays. We're, we're working, man. We're working, man. Because everybody's out. Everybody's off. It's yeah. so strange. <laughs> it is The strange. normality of a nine to five and how many people have Saturdays off and just like the energy behind a Saturday. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sometimes I forget if I have a Saturday off for whatever reason and I'm going, doing whatever. I'm like, God, there's so many fucking people out here. Jesus. Go yeah. home. <laughs> I'm trying to do stuff. Yeah, you you get it upsets you a little bit. <clears throat> like you begin like kind of not angry, but yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I'm just like, God, so many people. Yeah, or yeah, it's because then you feel it whenever there's lack of parking spots, or it takes forever to drive through, or whatever the ramification is for having so much like population, or like a uh, too much demand. It's like, oh my gosh, there's so much demand now. Everyone's out. Or whenever you go to a restaurant. It's like, oh, my God, 45-minute wait, hour and a half wait. Yeah. <laughs> go home, people. Yeah, I feel you. I'm trying to eat. Yeah. <laughs> Let my man eat, bro. Let me eat, man. Especially because there's this, like, it's hard for me not to be like, man, I serve, like, a billion people all the time every day. Y'all motherfuckers, you make me wait 45 <laughs> minutes? I should be royalty here. Yeah, come on. I could, I could roll up in the back of the house and be right at home. <laughs> yeah, bro. I thought, that's, that's a hard sentiment. You mm-hmm. can figure out a way to wrap that. Yeah. <laughs> Facts. It's, it's, that's tight. In the heart of the house. Yeah, bro. But that's just how we are because we treat every, anybody else from the service industry super well. Like, there is that mm-hmm. kind of code. Or, like, you want to show some extra love, you know what I'm saying? Something something light for them. Yeah. We, uh, it's a shared adversity or whatever it is. We are, we're able to identify with that. Yeah. The commonality. But, yeah. Being off on a Tuesday is nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Being off in the middle of the week, when there ain't shit going on, everything's open, and like the lines are minimal. It's like, oh yeah, I can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice, bro. I think about it too because it just feels weird. Sometimes it hits me, like you said, where the rest of the world is doing this today, but mm-hmm. like I'm doing this today, and like we're just mm-hmm. not on that regular metaculture schedule of like I work Monday and then thank God it's Friday, and then. Hump day was on Wednesday, just thinking about all the cultural hits. But then you get to Saturday, and it's mm-hmm. like, this is my free day. And then on Sunday, everybody's, like, resting up to go back for the week. So like, getting, Yeah, getting charged up Yeah, for the next five. Facts. So, yeah, whenever I'm... I feel like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's, like, what's going on most yeah, of the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess, when, when did that start? When did... Because back in, I don't know, let's say 100 years ago. Yeah. 150 years ago, uh-huh. in the 1800s. And before then, we were just working all the time. While the sun was up, probably. That's right. probably the thought, right? Yeah. And then if you were sure able to... Sure, was working all, every day, all day. Except for whatever, Sundays or Saturdays or whatever. Trying to keep the holy day holy. If you're following that tradition. But besides that, we're working all the time. <laughs> I guess when did the formal 9 to 5 get established? Like in the industrial age with like the Rockefellers and shit? <laughs> <laughs> probably, right? Early America? Like, uh, yeah... Thomas Shelby times. Mm-hmm. They had people that... 1900s? Yeah, there was regulations and stuff like Early. that. They had like... Uh, yeah, I think that show said like 1904 or something like that. I'm trying to create a 40-hour work week. Yeah. When did that get established? I'm going to look it up. Yeah, yeah. Where's my phone? Oh, shit. I don't know where it is. <laughs> I got you. It's gone. He's swimming. It's somewhere in the world. In the ocean. It's in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the ocean. Yeah. But yeah, but, but that, no, yeah. but the thing that the thing that hits me crazy though is the fucking dude. Like, so uh-huh. my whole career, and I'm like, because I'll be out there on you know a Tuesday, doing my whole day, and there's like nobody anywhere. Like, I, I was cut last Tuesday, and I was like, okay, I need to go stop at a place to get some tax information. I want to look for some new work shirts, and I'm gonna get some coffee, and then go to the grocery store. It's like a lot to do, and I was like getting it all done, and there's just like. It was, nobody's out. It's super easy. Mm. I was just like, oh, yeah. Like, 
it's just another way that you just kind of get hit with the fact that like we're on the shadow schedule of the, the meta schedule. <laughs> yeah. And it's crazy. Uh, what's because, deemed normal or whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. And then I, I kind of want to complain about it or like there's a part of my brain that's like, that sucks. And then I'm like, well, the crazy thing is like I'm paid a premium to work against the schedule of the nat. That's like part of what I'm like this. I am there to serve them when they have time to spend, which means I, I don't have time to spend while they have time to spend. And then like they're tip like tipping people extra on top of what they pay for being available and serving them while like they're able to consume it. So like it only exists in the shadow. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah Our yeah. whole industry is like that, <laughs> mm-hmm. which is kind of fucked. I think that's why we fuck with each other so much too, because it's like shared adversity, but it's also this whole thing. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It is a whole culture, a whole world, and it's crazy too. Because I was thinking about, I'm not sure why. Maybe that's partially. <laughs> why i'm like subconsciously attracted to uh cooking shows and mm-hmm. like that kind of stuff and victoria's as well so it's like super tight <laughs> so we're like always watching cooking shows and shit but cooking is inextricably tied to the service or like i guess the, to restaurants restaurants are built around the kitchen like what the fuck else are you gonna do like <laughs> we're not i guess part of the serving job is like the social interaction <laughs> and like the mingling and making people feel at ease and warm and like they're welcome to ask for stuff and you're gonna like make it happen but the, they came to there to eat you know so like every restaurant's built around like the the kitchen and like watching these, these cooking shows and it's crazy because we're watching uh we stumbled upon a, a cooking show in uh, hbo uh tournament of champions is what it's called and uh, guy fieri's the host but it has just like a whole bunch of badass chefs on it and it's like a bracket more or less and it's just like a blind tasting completely blind tasting and just a bracket and whoever wins wins simple super tight like a march madness for chefs yeah that's that's on site and it's I'm gas yeah. And it's, yeah it's crazy too because it's like it's like a crossover moment in my life as well or it's like an echo moment in my life where we started because as i mentioned big big time into into cooking shows watching all the gordon ramsay stuff like hell's kitchen and next level chef and then uh, i think hulu added chopped or a season or two, a couple seasons of chopped so i was like oh yeah fuck yeah let's watch chopped we watched a couple episodes of chopped for the last couple weeks maybe a month or two and then we stumble upon this show on HBO. And then it's like we're watching the first season, first episode, and all the chefs are being kind of introduced. It's like a 16. Yeah, it's eight on each side. 16 total chefs. And there's badass. And like most of them are, are like, are like I guess in Chopped, there's a three panel of judges who judge the food. And that three panel of judges gets like changed out throughout the seasons and throughout the episodes and whatnot. Okay, I'm with you. And... uh I, 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 there was at least like five or six of the chop judges that were like, were like competing on this show and i was like oh, this really? is fucking tight dude that's super tight yeah because like as and months or maybe a month or two ago when we were watching chopped early on we were made the comment of like uh it'd be cool to watch the judges you know they're always giving the critiques it's like you do a motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> that's so crazy and then yeah, we're just watching the stumble into this show i'm like oh my god they're all here. Like, pretty much all of them. This is tight. This show's badass. Dude, that is tight. Yeah, it was super, super cool. Kind of a... Uh, it's like, boop, boop, boop. You know what I'm saying? Like, the synchron Or not synchronistic, but... Yeah, not even just how cool is like it that they wrote the show, but, like, that you were just watching, like, one show at a time, kind of randomly. And mm-hmm. it's like, the dots just connected for you like that. Mm-hmm. It's fucking cool, bro. Yeah. But I think partially why I love those cooking shows so much is... Or also why like we're like subconsciously in the service industry, or how that came about within our mm. stories. Just like uh, I don't know, it's weird. No, I feel you. I respect the chef like a lot, just like supernaturally, mm-hmm. because it feels like they're the person at the top of the responsibility pyramid of producing said food. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot of pressure, mm-hmm. because the entire business is around, like you said, like we can't. If the, came here to eat good food. Yeah, if all the food came out completely wrong and tasted terrible and didn't look pretty, our jobs would be terrible. It would <laughs> be a terrible, terrible job for us because Ooh. the food sets the tone or like it's both, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That's why. Yeah, it's a combination. It reminds me of like just it's not like this, but it reminds me of it when I'm at work of like the same kind of relationship between skill position players and like the linemen on the football team. Because there's like a little bit like the linemen have like a like a different brotherhood. Like they're like super bonded and super tight. 
And then most of the time they think that the skill position people like are more or less don't understand like what they do at all. And what they do is what makes this whole thing work. And it sucks way worse than like just running routes. Like you ran like 50 routes. That's what you did. Mm -hmm. I got hit in the face 200 times. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. We ran for 212 yards today and that was 30 run plays and my face hurts. (laughs) It compared to like a wide receiver who scored mm-hmm. two touchdowns, maybe, and like, uh, you know, be on TV later. <laughs> Big difference. Yeah, super difference. It's a game within the game. Yeah, right. It's like Quidditch. <laughs> and that's a relationship that you have to manage as a team because you don't want like people not fucking with each other, more or less, or like. Uh, yeah, respecting each other's roles. Yeah, the respect thing needs to gel. You need to have like synergy and you need that energy to be kind of like bonded together more or less but Mm -hmm. if you have like places where it's off because the respect isn't quite there or like someone's you know and i'm just thinking about football but i think you can think about that in any workplace it's it's similar bro you know Mm -hmm. every branch does its part has its role to play its job to do yeah that's what what isn't that what belichick's about just do your job (laughs) yeah just do your job (laughs) (laughs) that's really funny that's it (laughs) Oh man, it is like that though. It's super true, bro. Yeah, yeah. I I realized that the the just do your job aspect and like that's the the idea of that. That's like a a primordial or like a human beyond language, like first language. You know, it's like because I guess it's like in the tangible, like our tangible. Because I I remember realized our, this kind of came about within myself whenever I was started at uh, the other spot and a lot of the back of the house were uh, Spanish speaking only, more or less. But I realized that I was able to jive with them and meld and gel with them easily because I know a little bit of Spanish at, at the time. I knew a little bit or at least some, a lot more now. Still been going on that shit. But I remember just like feeling, because I guess whenever you meet a new person at work, at the workplace, any of the new employees you're running into, you kind of have to like figure each other out, you know, or like try, try to figure out how to work into this social setting because you're like the outsider and they're like kind of taking you in and like you're figuring out how to get in. You don't want to like just like jump in and be like, what's up? I'm the new guy. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing new. <laughs> you don't need to be doing that. But you also don't want to be super like reserved and maybe cold or perceived to be cold, you know, antisocial. Yeah. So it's a it's a mix of mix of that, <laughs> somewhere in the middle of those two. Yeah, it, uh, well said. Yeah, I, that was, I put it great. I feel like, uh, but oh, sorry. All that to say, whenever you're meeting anybody in the new social, social workplace, I remember meeting those guys back at the house and Spanish speaking only, but we gelled really easily. And I and the, I was like, because uh, it was a mutual respect thing about working hard and just doing your job, <laughs> just doing your job. And I'm like, oh, they go hard. They do their job really well. And then they're like, oh, he, he goes hard. He does his job really well. And then it's just mutual respect based on that. Bang, bang, bang. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Across the spectrum. The hard work ever, or the language of, I, yeah. I forget what the quote is, but like mm-hmm. um, hard work's like a language that uh, transcends language or whatever the fuck. Mm-hmm. It, you don't have to know English and I don't have to know Spanish, but like if I, you know when someone works hard. Like mm-hmm. that, that has its own language. Like if you're if you're a hard worker, then there's things that, you know, where, like you know to check the thing behind the thing, and then you see someone else doing that, and you're like, oh fuck, they go hard. Like they're doing it for real. You know, like there's nuances to all of our job, and then when you see someone like hitting a high level of nuance with what they're doing, you're like, okay, like respect. It happens in basketball too. If you're just like, mm-hmm. the, absolutely, the third play of the game, the quietest dude on the court just fucking th- yaks on someone <laughs> like two handed right on the rim. <laughs> You're like, oh my gosh! Like they, you now respect him a little more than you did three they plays ago. Ball. Yeah. <laughs> you treat it differently. He's a hooper. You got to worry about that guy now. Like it just is. Like that's the thing is, it's almost primordial. Like it's not like, oh, okay, I'm gonna choose to think differently about this person. It's like you, you just you. You're like, oh, I have to respect that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or at least have to pay attention to that. Yeah. What just happened there? <laughs> yeah. Because there's like a, it's crazy. if we're really playing the game, then there's like a similar, we're all operating on similar game theory, which mm-hmm. means like we mm-hmm. similarly probably give importance to like these things or those things. And then, yeah, you just see someone like, for instance, showing up early all the time. Like, mm-hmm. that's just a trait where you're like, 
um, that person probably goes hard as fuck. That's like, imagine some, someone being like always the first one in the locker room on any football team or any basketball team. Like, it's like that guy, it doesn't necessarily mean he's cold. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's a good person, but like, it does show, it does trend towards that. That person might be someone who he might be going hard as fuck. If he's really that dedicated, mm-hmm. really that committed. Yeah. That level of commitment. Right. Is, uh, in line with an ideal trait or, you know, ideal traits, ideal behavior. Because how else can you manifest commitment and, and discipline? Yeah. It's a hard thing to outwardly express what your inward level of commitment is. But when you get an opportunity to flash that, if you want to, like at the gym, when I'm playing open gym and stuff like that, mm-hmm. I've noticed this crazy thing, bro, where you have to, uh, if I want to get picked up early and not have to sit three or four games, I got to like get out there. I got to dab people up. Then I got to like shoot a lot of shots, look super athletic for a second <laughs> <laughs> so that hopefully I could get like drafted. A little mini combine. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> it's like in my head, it's so crazy because, you know, I've played basketball there probably 18 to 20 times over the last two years for sure. And like I usually like to just go in there and just like quietly find out who's next and then just be like, OK, I'm going to run with you if that's cool. And then I'm going to go over there and, like, warm up super slowly and then kind of let the game, like, be when I actually start, like, running around and start going crazy. Like, I want to mm-hmm. warm up into it like that. Just, like, shoot threes with my shooter shirt on. Shooting little Steph threes. I'm not really thinking too much. I'm hitting little dances. Boom. Just trying to be loose. But, no, the last time, the last two times I went out there, I'm, like, doing A skips, <laughs> doing some B skips, <laughs> throwing the ball off the glass. Let me just let me just see how high I can rebound right here. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Come out there, you gotta hit some in rhythm. Like, let me show my hezzy, hezzy pull up. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, Boom. now they know I'm hooping. Yeah. Then it's super way more likely that either someone will ask me if I wanna play with them, or if I ask the person that has the last, sometimes they have five. But mm. if I'm asking them after I've done all that, they've definitely got room for me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's crazy, bro. The doors open up. Yeah, but it just made me – at first I wanted to be like – I don't know because the, the first time it happened, so two times ago, I was just kind of angry. And I just mm-hmm. got out there and I was like, dude, I'm going off today. Oh, right, wrong. <laughs> I was like started warming up aggressively. Let me just – oh, yeah, two hands. Okay, I feel good. My bird's getting there. Mm-hmm. Thank God we're doing daddies with Justin. Let's go. And uh, picked up really quick. And then I was like, man, that's crazy. Okay, well, let me just – Science. Come in kind of hot next time and then yeah. easy to get on a team. I was only like two games out instead of four games That's out. That's a great social science experiment. <laughs> right? Hilarious. I love it. Right? <laughs> that would kill. Well, just to actually film it? Oh, no. It was like a, a, that reminds me of – I think in college it was a – I forget what class it was, but there was a requirement to do some sort of social experiment. I forget what class it was. I remember some of, my, some of our friends had taken it and they were telling me about it. Mm-hmm. Or either way, I I'd he- I'd heard about it, but there was a assignment of doing a social experiment, and some people would stand the opposite way in an elevator, or some people would <laughs> like sit next to some, or like purpose purposefully sit next to somebody when there's a lot plenty of, of space <laughs> and stuff like that, and we'd like record the results. But that's that's a great one too, or you know, yeah, because there's something going on there. Oh, wait, hold on, before we get going, um, we're gonna quit, take a quick break because I realize the lights aren't on. <laughs> The what? The lights. Oh, hurt, hurt. Yeah, we're gonna get them on real quick. We'll be right back. Bam. And we're back. We're at the, talking about social experiments and stuff. But um, yeah, I had to turn the lights on. Realized that we still got like good like thirty to forty five left. I was like, oh shit. Let's put nice. them on real quick. Thank goodness. Nice catch. It's weird because it's the morning, so the yeah. lights are feel extra. Good morning. We're good morning. The morning pod. Yes, man. But we're talking about talking about. You picking up a or getting picked up a basketball after yeah. a solid combine showing. <laughs> yes, it, because I realized it also that thing had been presenting itself at work for me, <clears throat> like maybe like I don't know since I started at Blue pretty much, where I just realized that like uh, if you don't like it's if I don't you don't do some kind of combine like okay that's not the thought the thought that mm-hmm. came to me was um. The respect thing is like you can't help but give or take respect for someone or like take it away from them based on what you see in game. Yeah, based yeah, like the 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 tangible life game that we're all playing here because at work or basketball it's like obviously uh, tangible and you could 
it either goes in the hoop or it doesn't go in the hoop. And you either got the nuances and you don't, or you don't have the nuances or whatever. Your basketball IQ, all of that. But life is the same or it's like the tangible work environment. Like your, your job, whatever your job is. 100%. In this restaurant, we're doing this thing. Like my job is to do this. I run the food. Or right. I'm, like the, I'm like the assistant. I assist and I help and I pre bus and I take the shit away and I'm whatever their jobs like whatever the responsibilities are yeah like how they uphold them is tangible yes it is yes and there's an ideal and mm-hmm. there's like in basketball it's easier because you're gonna like keep score but you could like keep score in restaurant too you could say this is how many dollars we want to have how mm-hmm. far or close away are we from it and our performance affects that more or less yeah there's some restaurants that record how many trays you run that's crazy numbers on the board yeah bro I'll be running trays like a cracked man. Back whenever I was running trays, mm-hmm. when that fell on the servers, I was running trays, dog. Yeah, bro. All the trays. That was one of those things that it was just easier to run. If I hated it the whole time and was only going to run 10, it was just easier to hate it and run 30. I was like, I'm going to whoop the trays ass. I'm tired <laughs> of this tray whooping my ass. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah, being able to flip the script like that is super important. Hey, put it on its head. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that presented to me last night. The server was like, I don't know what to do about this problem at my table. Mm-hmm. I was like, you just put it on its head. <laughs> <laughs> you go talk to them directly about it. Like, yeah, You say something like this. You address this. Yeah. Say something along, along these lines. Usually give them, you usually just give them the dialogue and off they go. <laughs> I did that a lot last night. I, yeah. That was like all. Probably say like, this. Say something about this. Mm-hmm. Ask them if this is going to happen. And the response will tell you what to do. <laughs> yeah. It was tight too. Because like early on, I was like. Words are powerful. Like, if you phrase mm-hmm. something this way, you're going to get these kind of responses from them. If you phrase it this way, all of a sudden, now you've been taking blame and, and you're, like, unsure about yourself. Just because of the words that you use to express the same thing you're trying to do here. And so, like, make, just make sure you're using the right words when you're, like, asking for things or when you're, like, spilling something or even just, like, asking for a raise. Like, there's a difference in saying, um, <clears throat> give me more money. Yeah, that's give one. me more money now. <laughs> I deserve it. Give me more money. Mm. That's like uh, that's one way to put it. Run it. <laughs> <laughs> that's like your option. That's another a. way. <laughs> <laughs> that's your option B. It's option twenty one. <laughs> twenty one. The twenty one pack. Twenty one pack. No, but just in stating like, um, I wondered. I'm wondering what it would take for me to get a raise. That implies that like you were okay with a time frame. You're like, I'm wondering what I need to do here to get a raise. Mm-hmm. Or if you say, I think that I'm ready for a raise, but I wanted to know what you think about that like as well. Or another way to put it is like, yeah, I'd like a raise. That's the, that's the phrase. Mm-hmm. You can say like, um, when do you think I deserve a raise? Or you can say, I like a raise. And I think that like the phraseology of I like a raise imp- – if you're the other person and they're due for a raise and someone says, I'd like a raise, it's hard not to be like, oh, fuck, they're due. Okay, we'll give it to you. But if someone's like, what do I need to do here to get a raise? It's easier for you to be like, mm, show me this, this, and this, and then we'll talk about a raise. Because now the problem is dealt with and you don't have to pay money out like that. But mm. it's just in the phraseology of like just saying like, I'd like one. I think I'm ready for it. If if they're going to press you on like, if there's like hesitancy, like I, I think I'm ready for it. I have certainty. I'm pretty confident. I, I, I'm worth it. I'm at that mm. level. I know I am. And if it's cool with you, I'd like to just like, you know, make that jump. <laughs> that right there is power. It's so much more powerful than, mm-hmm. um, well, okay, well, what do I need to do here? I think I'm there. But like, what do you want to see? For, um, I, like, that's a good, I mean, it's honest. You're being humble. Mm-hmm. But like, I just think the other option is more dynamic. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think, yeah or I think you need to be willing to, I guess, do the work on the back end. Or else, unless you know, well, either way. Like, doing the work is, like, the inevitable, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, it's, like, if you do, it's, like, I've been doing the work, and no matter what, else, like, whatever stipulations you're going to put in front of me, I'm going to do those regardless as well. Or it's, like, doing or upholding my responsibility at a high level is what I, like, just kind of do. So, I'm just going to keep keep doing that. And because I've been doing that, I think I deserve a raise. And if even if uh, you don't give it to me right now, then I'll – I'm now on the track for sure to get it. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I think we both have been That's the way to go about it. I agree with you. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I think yeah, I think yeah, you definitely hit hit a, hit a truth with the energy behind your phraseology and 
the, the, also like a, the, the truth that whenever you give someone dialogue, there's only so many things they could respond with, or there's only so many things that could logically happen in the story as far as like storytelling goes. Uh huh. Because things could be completely spontaneous and random. Sometimes you have to do that. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> out of nowhere. It's like we're having this dialogue and then this happens, or like they mention this, or this this thought populates. But for the most part, like whenever you're spieling a menu or talking to guests at a restaurant, like there's only so many things they're gonna have questions about about the menu. There's mm-hmm. only so many things they're gonna ask about about the wine or whatever. Right. There's only so many things. So many things. You're right. And like your, your dialogue is super important because it helps. It opens the doors, I guess. It opens. It opens the. The potential. Your use of whatever you say opens up the potential responses and the kind of creates yeah. manifests this whole everything. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The whole situation. The clip that that's genius. <laughs> like I, I, for context, like I feel like, for, like if you ask someone, do you have any questions about the drink menu, or if you ask someone, do you want to hear about the most popular drinks that we've been selling so far, the ones that are doing the best, and then the, like, the information that you then have to provide mm-hmm. is obviously different. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Way different. Super different. And then once I get them on, like that's that's the question that they're asking anyways. Like. They're, unless they have a specific question about a specific drink, I kind of like can just kind of like expedite that process. Be like, I'm going to tell you about these ones. These are these ones. These are this, this, and this. And then from that point, like the what what what's happening there? Their lack of information, their their wanting of context, their need for direction has then been met in a way that's like in our favor. Like we're up from that conversation mm. rather than being on our heels and having to like get burnt d- downfill deep <laughs> by the wide receiver <laughs> because you don't know the answer to a question that you couldn't, that you helped them propagate. Like, you know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. It's like, bro, like we could just play to our advantage if they let us. Sometimes they don't let us, you know what I'm saying? Mm. But the percentages play out. That's one thing I realized working years in a row at a restaurant mm-hmm. is like the questions are similar over time. Not any given day to day, I can't be like this table. I mean, sometimes you can read a table and be like, first time table, super noobs. They're definitely gonna <laughs> super want, noobs. They're definitely gonna want X Y Z. Uh-huh. And like, not in a. I'm just like that's in, obviously a gross fucking stereotype. I don't really think that about people, but just over time, if I think about the stats, like, I, you, you could recommend Bella Gloss at J Prime like a billion times in a row, and it, it hits like. If, as long as you know when you're playing that card and you play it to the percentages, you hit like 99% of the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and there's other things that just like – same questions get asked all the time. If you learn how to tell the difference between this and this because steak eaters get to this point in the decision tree and you just have a really good this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> been working on that move. Yeah. Like it's – over time it gets so – it's crazy how many times you'll get better at saying the, the same thing <laughs> because you say it a hundred times over a year. A hundred times, bro. Yeah, it's not 20 different variations. Yeah. Keep on throwing into it, trying to change it up a little bit. You get it like past tense and then present tense. And <laughs> sometimes you're talking about it from this angle, but it's still like the thing you're talking about from it, you know? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. If you work in steakhouses long enough, you're going to get the same steak questions at every steakhouse you work at. Of course. Can you explain what age and dry age? Yeah. Like, can I? I was like, what what, t- what cuts the most tender? <laughs> Let me tell you, sir, about tender cuts of steak. <laughs> you get to be a fucking genius in that moment. Yeah, yeah. And you know what you're talking about. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're fucking Matt Damon. And how do you like them apples? Yeah, good little hunting. Yeah. For real. Yeah, it's, seriously. It's hilarious. But it's, yeah, it's all information based. It's all information based. And you can uh, help guide your information or help guide the information in the story. Yeah. The entire situation. What's what's happening at that table? Like, just based on your dialogue. Oh, it's crazy because, yeah, you mentioned that yeah, you're able to, like, dish out shit real quick. You know what I'm saying? And I've, I've, I've been uh, empathizing with that feeling. And it's funny because I saw it manifest and play out in a cooking show in a Next Level Chef with Gordon Ramsay. Because it's three chefs or it's Gordon... Naisha, Arrington, and uh, Richard Blaze, and all three of them are like the mentors, and like they all have teams. And uh, there's like four or five on each team to get started, but then there's three different levels to the kitchen. And throughout the competition, they're just competing and doing different, like specified challenges for each week. And there was a Gordon was just doing his thing last week, and like they were just uh, because each chef is like mentoring them and like kind of helping their team. It is ultimately like unbiased as far as who wins to a degree, you know, like all of them are just competing and whoever the, like if one team has three of their teammates or three of their team members in the finale, then like, that's just like, it is, it is what it is. Like the, the eliminations are blind tasted. So uh, regardless, 
So like, but but they do mentor their team like as the weeks go on. So like, they're kind of getting coached up by whoever their head captain is or whatever their team leader. So Gordon's team, he's just going off, and he like it just is like a scene of him in like the last couple minutes of their ch- their challenge. And he goes, there's like four chefs or five chefs on his team, and it's just like a scene of him going from like each chef to like in their final minutes, and he's like taste someone's pasta. He's like, I'll taste that pasta because you can't like tell them exactly what to do, or you know what I'm saying. You can't like cook a dish for them. But he's just like giving them advice and trying to point them in the right direction. He's like, taste that pasta. And he's like, oh my God, yeah, that's that pasta is almost inedible. <laughs> and he's like, all right, thank you, chef. And he cooks it up more. And then he's like, um, this goes on to, I forget who else he goes on to. But there's like two or three of them. And then there's like another one. And this chick has like a, I think it's called a duck egg. It's like a black egg, a century egg is what Gordon Ramsay refers to it as. But she's like, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to use this or how to incorporate this duck egg. And then he's like, get your knife really hot. Cut it in half, cut it into quarters, and put that quarter on top as a garnish. And he's like, that's what you wanted to do, yes? And she's like, yes, chef. <laughs> he's just like, boop. And it's just like seamless. Like, he just knows how to handle, like, and, and at all, all points in, throughout their cooking experience, he's able to just, like, kind of know. And they're all cooking different shit. They're all different ingredients. But he's able to just know enough about the meta of cooking in general to, like, address every potential issue, that they, every question they could have about cooking whatever it is they're cooking. And he just handles it all, just like bam, 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 bam. I was like, "Oh my god, he's nasty! <laughs> he's fucking nasty!" <laughs> oh man, dude, that's awesome. He's like mm-hmm. a master craftsman. You know what I'm saying? That's what it looks like. Yeah, he's a master. It's crazy. Yeah, I was, I was just knowing the answers to the, knowing the information. He has all the information. Yeah, as much as any chef alive, I'm sure that motherfucker's going in, bro. He's been going in for decades now. Yeah, he's correct. He's cracked. He was, <laughs> He's a cracked man. He was like my mom's favorite chef. Like, right? It's 15 years ago. You know what I'm saying? Mm. At least 10 years ago. It's crazy. Yeah, I think I remember your mom watching Hell's Kitchen. Yeah, yeah like, for sure. I remember seeing that or like the red and the blue, like uh, chef coats and stuff. I remember like seeing that in my mind's eye as a child, like in your house, like <laughs> at least once or twice. For sure, for sure. No, yeah, definitely watch uh, that shows. Yeah, like 20 years old. For sure. Super deep. That's a fun <laughs> show to watch while you're cooking dinner because you're like, fuck, I, got, I can't lose. Mm. I ain't getting kicked off tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, yes. It's, yeah, and that's another thing I kind of realized when I was thinking about, like, wow, I like cooking shows so much over the, like, I guess probably the last day or two. But I was talking to Victoria about it. And I was just like, I think cooking shows are dope because it's like, it's like a creative art or a creative expression art <sighs> form. And there's like taking the raw ingredients of life and creating masterpieces you know it's it's like art it's art for sure it's definitely an art and it's a creative expression it's like music like any creative expression to a degree but cooking's tight because shit tastes good or it doesn't taste good or it's like it's cooked or it's not cooked you know it's like there's no debate it's like with rap there's a lot of debate or with art it's abstract and i guess we can debate about grammys and emmys and nominated awards and such but still it's like there's always the debate in the abstract Whenever you're talking about, I guess, merit or quality of abstract creative art, but food is like pretty tangible. It's like that shit, it tastes good or don't. No, it's the fucking not, dog. Like, That's like, this so shit, funny. It's fucking raw. Like <laughs> you can't tell me this is cooked. Yeah. It's like that. I love that aspect of it. And then also, it's also because it's so relatable. At least in the sense that everyone, not everyone's a chef, but everyone's a cook. Everyone has to prepare food for themselves in some capacity. You have to make cereal. You got to make sandwiches. You got to fucking do, do something to keep your human alive. We're all tasked with that. So we all have to do it. And these motherfuckers just take that to the nth degree. It's like rappers. It's like not everyone's like, we all use words. But it's like we all think and use words. But it's not the same. It's a little different. <laughs> Too true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What it's, what do you, what, how do you get to that place? You know what I'm saying? Cat Williams says, we should just be blessed and grateful. We use words to make crazy amounts of money. Like everybody talks, Joe. Mm-hmm. But like not everybody gets not paid. Not everybody talks, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I, that hit me. I was like, oh, fuck. Like I do want to use my words to make money. And I was like, I do use my words to make money. Mm, boom. You know what I'm saying? Got him. <laughs> so I was like, okay, yeah. I'm already on that track. You know what I'm Facts, saying? I'm already absolutely. practicing that shit. Like it's just – and it's not like it's not worth the money. Like, we love rappers. You know what I'm saying? Like, great service is awesome. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Like, we appreciate it. So, being good at that thing, whatever it is, or even like you said, cooking. Like, so good at, so knowledgeable about not like cooking necessarily, like cooking the dish, but just like 
cooking as like a whole fucking meta subject. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, if you can get to that point where you like transcend what a general person's experience of that thing would be, and you can just like walk in and fix it for them instantly, you can know what they're thinking. It's like what? Mm-hmm. Yeah, know what what tool to use and how to use it to get it to get the job done to get this bridge built. Yeah, I guess what I'm saying is if you can do that, well, you get paid like a lot of money. Like Gordon Ramsay's making a lot of money, you know, because he knows how to cook. That motherfucker making lots of money. <laughs> he knows how to cook, and he's on thirty different shows. He has a crazy amount of shows, and he's doing them all the time, all the time. So is that the other part of making the wealth? Is like Knowing the craft super well, but also being able to dominate the industry. Like, so Drake's doing too. It definitely helps. And he has, yeah, he's doing so many shows and he's been cooking for so long and he has so many restaurants. Mm. He has he's a lot deep. of restaurants, dog. He's deep. He's deep. He's fucking goaded, bro. He's goaded. He's one of my goats. <laughs> I was like, that man's doing it in his industry, in his field of study, in his domain and his arena he's a fucking he's him dog he's fucking hitting the gritty bro for real he's crazy and he like i also empathize and like fuck with him heavy because he records it all or you know what I'm saying? he like not like a documentary style of his life but he's on so many shows yeah he's on so many shows boom, i'm just like bro content content machine he's a content machine bro yes dude and everyone loves never stop a gordon ramsay clip it's like Tiger Woods effect, or like you're just like, oh, Gordon Ramsay. Gordon Ramsay. Let me see. Let me check this out. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's just one of those people that. He's crazy. Yeah, he's crazy. He's cracked. He's a cracked man. Yeah. So yeah, cooking goat. Go. See that? Yeah, for sure. Cooking shows are tight. I fuck with him. That's a cool thing to be into because yeah, it's, it's just like well, people just be watching TV. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, it's tight, it's tight too because Victoria likes it a lot as well. So I'm like, that's tight. Nice. I, I remember watching Chopped like a long time ago as a kid. Maybe not kid, like teenager probably. I was like, oh man, this show's tight. <laughs> this is a good passing of time whenever there's nothing else to watch. Or like whenever there's a passing of time you have to do as a kid, there's like a hierarchy of shows to watch <laughs> whenever they're available. Whenever that was the thing we had to deal with in life. You had to wait for shows to come on at a certain time. There was no really instant streaming. And like TiVo was kind of new, like recording and DVR and shit. Yeah. That like slowly integrated into it. But whenever you're a kid, you just have like regular cable or whatever. It's like, yeah, whatever's on at six o'clock, you have to like flip through the, like your usual channels, like ESPN, Nick, the cartoon channels, fucking TBS, yeah, dude, Fox. If we had to if TNT, go to channel 14 for USA. the TV guide and you're like watching all 100 channels. Mm. You're like, okay, that's on that. That's on that. That's on that. No, Family Guy, I'm putting it down. Yeah. <laughs> what wins? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I don't even have to yeah. see anymore. We've yeah. seen enough. Yeah, Chop would Chop would win sometimes for me. I'm like, this is this is a this is a good show. It wins, for sure. I nice. watch it again. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I was young and now yeah, no. Love watching cooking shows. Yeah. Else kitchen and shit. But, yeah. Uh, and it also hits especially because you're living in the the shadow of the service industry. Yeah. And so that's your life almost, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like that's like if we were 49ers, it'd be watching a show about gold. You know, it's like, this is why we're here. It's for this thing right here. This is what we're doing. <laughs> watching how to, how to swing a pickaxe. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it's about, boys. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, Yo, the 40 hour work week. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Back to that. Back to that initial thought. That seed planting. Yeah. The thing that we're in the shadow of, that thing came to be. Uh, in 1938, Congress passed the 38 Bang. squat. I've been holding on to that. I just wanted to drop a 38 real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, 44 hours was the original work week. I guess they had you go at nine a day. Out early on Friday. I don't know what that is. Congress amended the Fair Labor Standards Act, limiting to 40 hours in 1940. So 44 hours. Yeah, what, nine hours a day and out early on Fridays? <laughs> that's, how, that's how I've assigned those hours. I don't know what they were doing. And then in 1940, it was 40. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Who, de- who decided the work week was five days? Henry Ford in 1926, under the leadership of Henry Ford, instituted an eight-hour day, five-day work week. Then in the Great Depression, owing to unemployment, the idea for a six-hour work week came for a while. But it says that they were probably working like a lot. And then I guess 
Henry Ford. If he introduced it in 1926, it was probably the best model for like people in labor unions to be like, well, why can't we have it like them? <laughs> <laughs> they were like, you can. You can have it like them. And then, yeah, that was probably the model for a long time after that. So it's almost been 100 years. It's been like 84 years. Yeah, because back in the Viking days, I'm pretty like early bird gets the worm. If you can get up like while it's light, but the sun's not up, start working those fields and stuff, you know, mm-hmm. they're probably working. I mean, could you imagine being a Viking? And I'm, I'm like, I think we should take more days off. <laughs> <laughs> Kill him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, listen, listen, listen. Just hear me out. Just hear me out. Okay. Okay. We'll get more work done in the long run, guys. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hear me out. Think about this. <laughs> yeah. You guys are hurt. This guy's knee is destroyed. You guys can't walk right now. I know. Oh. There's a little more rest. Like, can we just be friends, bro? Like, let's <laughs> hang out, bro. Let's, let's <laughs> drink. <laughs> Cause we are day off, bro. Come yeah. on, man. Five on. Difficult pitch because mm. yeah, I think you know it's Our just farmers back in the day. What are you gonna say? Sorry. Even just if so, if a powerful leader was like always said the idea, like if we stop working, we're gonna die. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <We're> gonna, <laughs> you and your kids and everyone we know <laughs> go on. <laughs> <laughs> if we if we don't work very hard all the time, <laughs> and like it's a fair argument, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's still today. It's like sometimes yeah. you want to even with yourself. You're like, kind of want to take the day off. Mm. You'll die. You'll, like, <laughs> you'll die, kid. Yeah. yeah. I was just gonna say, yeah, like like with farmers, for example, back in the day, you kind of had to, or it's like we're gonna not fucking tend the tend the field today. It's like we gotta eat, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Literally need to put food on my table. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, they were they mm. fucking lobbied for more hours in the day. They're like, we need more time. We're not enough time. Let's we need see. more time. Give me an extra hour, dude. What a genius farmer it was just like, hear me out. <laughs> <laughs> we can't move the sun, but we can move the us. Mm-hmm. We just just imagine moving your watch back an hour. <laughs> we take bikini bottom and we push <laughs> it somewhere. Else. <laughs> Yeah, this guy's cracked. Yeah, I like what you're thinking, though. <laughs> I like what you're like, Come on, kid, let's do it. Yeah, we still deal with this. Crazy. Say fuck time. Let's yeah, we, move, move that bitch back an hour. Golly, yeah, we got still move. feeling the ramifications of that to this day. <laughs> you fucked me last week, a couple days ago. People from 1940, mm-hmm. man, <sighs> gone. 23 yeah. hours in that day. Yeah, I don't wanna, we were always talking about fucking daylight savings every time we go through daylight savings. <laughs> So it's a song, bitch. Yeah, it'll be nice when it hits on the backside, though. It's a sweet kiss. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, what we're talking about, though, we're talking about well, fucking. Just the 40 hour work week was kind of. Yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, yeah, you probably did work six days a week and rest on the Sabbath because it's all institution. That's what I'm saying. When it was Viking times, depending on your tribe leader, probably. Mm-hmm. Like, and then if. You know, I don't know. There's probably some tyrannical tribe leaders that were like, no, like, I'm enslaving people and we're taking prisoners and we're working all the time and we ain't never going to stop making this dynasty. That was like a real way of being and shit. And that's fucking... I'm sure. That shit sucks, I'm sure. <laughs> really bad. That's like the worst in end the of the bar- spectrum. In the barbarian times, bro. We were savages back in the day. Yeah. A couple thousand years ago or however long. Yeah, almost inhumane. We're different savages now. For sure. Yeah, I was thinking about that the other day. That thought populated in my mind of like how savage we were to like create the fucking Bill of Rights. I think it's in the Bill of Rights. It's like the Eighth Amendment, I think. It's like no cruel and unusual punishment. It's like, what? <laughs> we needed, Shit was so cruel and unusual, but it was usual back then. <laughs> so now we had to deem it unusual because that shit's fucked up. That's unusual. <laughs> What? What? Son. It's like pulling people apart, like limb by limb from limb. Stop. You only have devices and machines to do that shit, bro. Yeah, bro. They fucking would just like pull you apart and like cut you in half and shit. Oh, jeez, Put your bro. head on a spike. Oof. All yeah. kinds of crazy the shit. Vikings At what point did crazy. that become unusual? <laughs> yeah. Testament to the consciousness. <laughs> Preach. That's God. Yeah, seriously. Well, that was the institution that I'm talking about too. That made the mm. Sabbath holy. You know, like people. Uh, that was probably a response to pure evil. Was like something holy to protect them and keep them up. Because, bro, and <laughs> stop beheading people. <laughs> yeah, shit. Yeah, it's crazy Quit out here. Stoning people to death. Yeah, no. Oh, whatever the fuck. Definitely all through. So Viking times was like through the 1600s. 15 to 1600s was Viking times. Okay. Um, which is only like fucking a couple hundred years ago. Yeah, bro. 
It's not that long. Not that long, not bro. That long. Yeah, and then uh, I don't. I mean, George Washington and them were seventeen hundreds, yeah, right? Seventeen seventies. Yeah, and so that's when they were like. I don't know when they wrote the Bill of Rights, but I, th- I don't think it was too long after. Yeah, it had to be early inception. Yeah, because there were like, the no quartering soldiers was a big thing. I'll just say like eighteen hundreds or so. Right. So no cruel and unusual punishment was probably going on through like four or five hundred years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck, dog. Yeah. It, it, all before that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Back to the Greeks to Romans. Back to the Egyptians. Back to Mesopotamia, dog. <laughs> way back. That shit go way back, dog. <laughs> That's scary, bro. That shit's scary, bro. That just scary. <laughs> That's a scary movie. <laughs> For real. Well, oh, okay, shit. there's an argument to be made that <laughs> this is fucked up, right? <laughs> yeah. We're doing that's, crazy shit. That's to why people. the urge to be a savage is so high. That's why testosterone exists. So you can mm. be like, I ain't going out like that, <laughs> motherfucker. Fuck that, motherfucker. I'm killing you, dog. Like, I'm not saying we should be like that. I'm not. But like, I think that's why that's there. Like, motherfucker, the only people that survived were people that had that, bro. Oh my god. <laughs> And we needed babies. That's, the, that's why estrogen exists, bro. We needed babies. We trying to make this thing last, bro. <laughs> Get this shit going. Yeah, for real. Oh, it, my gosh. <laughs> Elon Musk says the same thing. It's funny how it transcends huh. time, bro. What? Elon Musk says we don't have a fucking global warming problem. We have a fucking population problem. Hmm. Like, the, the number of people, the growing rate of people has slowed down significantly. And that there's a lot of social pressure and a lot of life pressure and a lot of overpopulation, quote unquote, issues that are making people not want to reproduce. And it's creating like such a dramatic slowing in the rate. Like, yes, we have more people than we've ever had on Earth. But in the last like 20 years, the compared to the 50 to 100 to 200 years before that, the amount of kids that we're adding is like super low. It's like, yeah, the rate of diving. increase. Yeah. And so um, Elon Musk is like, that, that should be one of our like. Prime concerns, because that's like, uh, uh, yeah, t- yeah, it's Elon Musk. Um, <clears throat> so he's, he's saying population problem on the other side, yeah, over, but going on the trend of under. Yes, and that's mm. why he's trying to take people to Mars. I mean, he's cra- uh, crazy. Crazy is a weird word, right? This like, man's cracked. He's cracked for <laughs> sure. He's like, let me. I know how we can solve this problem by continuing to move us into this futuristic shit that no one thinks we can do. Just like every other fucking technology advance we've ever had. We take the people to the moon, we build domiciles, or to, then we take people to Mars, we find water on Mars, we find a way to turn this like ice crystals into water, we find a way to control the atmosphere with the water that we find, we build domiciles, we send people up there, they start having kids that are born up there, all they know is trying to make Mars work, and then humans do what humans do. Like, cancer. <laughs> <laughs> like that's, that's this, one of the smartest guys in the world. This motherfucker makes electric cars, rocket ships. He's, flamethrowers. He's one of the craziest people in the entire world. He owns Twitter. Mm-hmm. And he's so rich. Like, that's the other thing. You can't say this man's like not successful. You guys all the people in the meta play the money game. He's big up on you guys. So like he's got like fuck what you have to say money. He literally was like, fuck you guys. You wanna block my ad campaign on Twitter? You wanna you don't wanna sell me ads on Twitter because I own Twitter? Fuck you. I don't need your money. Mm. He's cracked, dude. And cracked, like man. that guy says He's a bad man. <laughs> We don't have enough family units and kids. Like it's gonna be a real issue. Mm. So that's crazy. We'll see how it plays out. Yeah, yeah, for real. But yeah, just thinking about people as a whole coming from mm. five hundred years ago, we had being savages, dog. Savages. Bro. Now we'd be fucking moon men. We'd be spacemen. What? We'd be spacemen, bro. <laughs> that's crazy, bro. I wonder if we're gonna go to Mars in our lifetime, or I guess, do you think we're gonna go? Like a a, a human touchdown in Mars? Dude, I think like in our lifetime. By the time we're fifty, the news is gonna be so nuts to us because we like <laughs> saw a cell phone happen. But yeah. like in twenty, like we're 20 right on years, the cusp bro. of that te- technological boom before phones. Yeah, people had internet, but it was like <laughs> <laughs> like super slow, like crazy dial up. Yeah, people were playing like fucking pinball and stuff on. Had a landline. Yeah, all that. Like, what that was crazy to our parents. So, like, we saw that jump too. Our parents were like, oh my God, technology's nuts, bro. Why is that? 
Like, nothing, bro. <laughs> every step you believe this shit, bro. <laughs> yeah. You can't believe this. You can't believe this shit, bro. <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll never know. I had an Atari, bro. Yeah, a Walkman, bro. <laughs> yeah. you know, a 12, a 12 track. Is that what's called? 12 track? It's like we don't do 8 track. 8 track, there yeah. it is. Yeah. Something like that. Like, we're all 12, bro. We got four less tracks, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you, we, we wish it was a 12 track. <laughs> yeah, bro. I'm saying, like, that's just bananas, bro. Joe Rogan says it's aliens. So then just to maybe assume in the next 40, 50 years, some crazy shit's going to happen? What were you going to say? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's what we're, we were talking about. But by the time we're 50 or 60, I do think that – I think Elon Musk might be like five years away if I'm being like my, my most generous. Whoa. I think within five years, he's going to pay people a million dollars each. They got to sign all the waivers in the world, and they're going to try to be the first people to go to Mars. And he'll probably bring them back too. He's probably just going to try to like get it there, touch it. Come back. No way. Bring him back, too? That's, oh, yeah. I guess he's not going to leave him there. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to do that. He's not quite ready to do that yet. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, domiciles. Won't they lose t- age or some shit? Are they going to be like... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. All that space shit, though. Whatever whatever the price is. It's going to take... Yeah, they're going to they're gonna come back and be the same age, but like three years will have passed. <laughs> They'll be like the leap. They'll be like fucking leap McConaughey, yeah. McConaughey and Interstellar, dude. But but I think that that's like where his head's at. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh-huh. how do you eat an elephant, right? Like, we gotta send some people up there and try to bring him back. Send Let's... a monkey up there first, <laughs> <laughs> dude. Yeah, space I guess so. monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. But yeah. So then, okay, so that's my most generous, sir. I think you could poke some holes on that for sure. Okay, okay. <laughs> but I think 20 years, I'm like, there's no way he doesn't get to the point where he's like, I'll just go myself. Like, Fuck him. <laughs> yeah, I'll find the water. How old is he? Is he in his 50s? I don't know. Yeah, quick quick Google search. How old is Elon Musk? I had to guess. 52. Okay, 50s. Early 50s. What? I mean, if anybody's going to have some good 70. health. By the time he's 70. Mm-hmm. He'll still be all there, hopefully, right? Hopefully he's he got the best shot. Physical health. I mean, he does have like the highest level ops coming at him, so it's hard to trust a doctor. You know what I'm saying? Mm, facts. That's how they got Michael. How they? How they? Who? What's gonna happen, man? Yeah, he he had to buy Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> he's like fuck everybody. I'm buying Twitter. <laughs> yeah, he's playing Kanye West. Like, put it on his head game. Mm-hmm. But put it on his head game gets dangerous when you're deep, bro. He big up though. He's gotta have some like. Some sort of crazy kind of security, right? That's what I was, I was going to ask you. What do you think of security? He's got to have like? some, some fucking some hitters on that shit, right? Dude, his He's life gotta is to have good some enough. ninjas. Maybe a couple, <laughs> couple snipers. <laughs> I don't know. Roaming helicopters. Yeah, yeah. Dude, I feel like he... Some ghillies in the mist, bro. For, sh- for sure. But he's got some bulletproof glass wherever he's at. Mm-hmm. That's why he made that cyber truck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's a little paranoid, a little nervous. That's his, bro. Yeah, he bro. designed it for himself. So you guys can have some too. Yeah. That's crazy, bro. I'm saying, bro, like, his life has got to be nuts. Nuts, so life. Nuts. That's got to be, if you can ever play Roy, you like. boy's be, going ham. Play Musk. That shit's nuts. Play Musk. <laughs> You've chosen Elon Musk. Yes, bro, that man's crazy. <laughs> Doing Seriously? the most. Yeah, but, uh, okay, Let's so the, the bigger thought that led me to talking to you about all that is these things transcend time. Mm. Like population problems mm. and like over savagery. And I could probably think it's like war and famine. These things like transcend time. It's kind of crazy. And then the other thought I wanted to share was the Egyptian culture might have been like as sophisticated as us. Mm-hmm. Just like different, and then we, yeah. we have this natural predisposition to think that the further back in time you go, the more like super dumb Pre-histo- people were. Prehistoric. Yeah, you're like <laughs> can't talk, caveman. Okay, yeah. yeah, you're like banging clubs, like who? The Flintstones, <laughs> right? And I didn't really watch the Flintstones, but like the idea of these like kind of mm. super unsophisticated people is like the nicest thing to put it. Yeah, yeah, more animal than whatever we consider humans to be now. Yes, but I don't know. I don't, we don't know if that's. Tr- I don't know if that's true. You know what I'm saying? Maybe not all the time. Who knows? Yeah, no. I think I've been listening to enough Joe. <laughs> yeah, and it makes sense, or it makes maybe not make sense to me. Like I'm able to accept it just right away that the Egyptians were, or I guess prehistoric, or what we consider to be prehistoric, thousands of years ago cultures could have been more advanced than us. Like I could, I could see that happening. Like I don't. And the thing that I guess the thing that makes me lean that way is just the idea of 
or having the openness behind the uncertainty of who really knows how the fuck who knows who knows for sure that's the thing you know? that's the thing like, no one can really de- definitively say one way or the other exactly what the hell's going on how they built the pyramids what they were doing what they were up to the technology they had how sophisticated or lack thereof sophistication they were i think in any time period that's the truest thing about it mm-hmm. is that you can never know mm-hmm. unless you were there right and there's no there's there's written testimony mm-hmm. but like you know that's what makes it so fascinating i think that's why the narrative can be manipulated yeah Hundred percent, super true. Game of Thrones, bro. Really? <laughs> yeah. So I, I love Game of Thrones. I gotta watch Game of Thrones. That's one of the. I remember or coming to that kind of realization or that uh, stumbling into that thought of appreciation of why I like Game of Thrones so much and what like what was so cool about it and what was so drawing and gripping about it. Like off the rip, like within the first season or the first yeah you know, the first book whatever is because it was uh, that was one of the truths that it kind of played with and it incorporated into its storytelling was the how that narratives can be manipulated to the general public and they're none the wiser, but like the truth, there is an ultimate like truth underneath, but you can just like completely manipulate the narrative and people don't even know, you know what I'm saying? Cause they weren't even there. They weren't there. They, they weren't in the room where it happened. And, and like uh, fucking what's, what's her name? Like they, uh, Diana Polka chick on Joe Rogan podcast when she's talking about people, Going back to oral, oral traditions and meetings, where it was called pencils up or whatever, that terminology where in which you don't write anything down. It's just, there's no paper trail within anything that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. So, like, it's, who really knows anything about fucking anything, dog? Yeah, bro. <laughs> that you, shit's crazy. You it's, know what we're told, you know? Yeah. And that creates this dissonance that would make it, like, it's, when you know something, it's, like, not unknown. It crosses the threshold into known territory, and that's like not interesting or satisfying or scary or anxiety inducing. It's not, there's no potential to it. Hmm. Wait, what do you mean? Information that you can't just like know. Like, they found a methodology to create information that like you would never exactly know what it is. That's why the Egyptians, I think, are so fascinating and why Joe Rogan talks about it all the time. He can always be like making money or like these conspiracy theory pages. Like, they are able to exist and be popular like shows like ancient aliens because you don't we'll never know it's like ah, mm. I, you, you might be right like fuck i don't know like if someone was You're just like saying finding bigfoot yeah <laughs> if someone's just saying the sky's red like if there's a whole show about the sky's red but like it, obviously it's not red like i look outside and it's not red and mm. like it wouldn't be it, it might be funny after a while saying. you know what i'm saying yeah, like yeah, yeah, but yeah. If the ambiguity behind the uncertainty creates is... this like drawing yeah it's drawing mm. almost you almost want to hear about a conspiracy theory sometimes like yeah. you're like hold on what's going on here i don't fucking know damn i don't know it could be <laughs> son of a bitch who knows they know let me go figure it out what do they have to say do you know <laughs> yeah there's like a whole thing that happens there and uh. like obviously you shouldn't as a person you shouldn't get drawn into conspiracy theories because like you go down the rabbit hole too far drawn, and- yeah okay <laughs> maybe maybe commit to too many commit on a on a Emotional level. <laughs> Emotion, <laughs> an emotionally attached level. You shouldn't get emotionally attached to any conspiracy theories. They're, they're fun to play with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that thing exists because of the ambiguity behind the uncertainty. Mm. There's some kind of drawing force to it. Yeah. And I think that's... Um, then the, then the, a pencils up meeting is like a methodology of creating information that has amb- ambiguity to it. Versus like if someone records it on video and then there's like proof. There's like proofed information. There's no ambiguity to it. It crosses a threshold where it's, like, mm. safe information. But, like... Solid within objective reality. Yes. Like that shit's going on. You have to agree that that's true or you're off the path of, like, what's going on here. You're crazy. You're cra- <laughs> <laughs> but more than just calling someone crazy, like, uh-huh. there's a truer thing going on, and it's a lot like basketball. That if you're not trying to win the game, then, like, something's wrong. Like, you're doing something wrong, more or less. Like, you, you might not get picked up or you might get benched or a coach might get fired. If you're not doing your best to win. Mm. And then in life, there's a similar thing going on where if you're not like, if you know something, but you're not doing your best with the thing, like if you are have solid, concrete, objective information, but you are like your game plan or how you're playing is goes against that solid information that you have, you're creating like an energy disruptance and you're not maximizing your potential for every day. 
And then the ultimate pursuit of this game, I think personally, is to be on that maximum personalized energy every day, like doing your best. And, mm. and, and if you're even subconsciously or consciously knowingly not doing your best and like you're OK with that it doesn't bother you. Like, I'm not trying my best every day. I've got this thing happened to me and I've got this thing going on and I'm tired and all of this. Like, it's so easy to think like that, right? Mm -hmm. But, like, there's a – life then has ramifications for you. Like, your your karma isn't, like, pure. And you don't have – I don't – that's – we're stepping into a spiritual ambiguity <laughs> side of things that, like – Who knows? You, you know? know? I don't know. I don't know. I don't we're know. Trying to figure it out. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? But I think <laughs> when I notice the game of life and I notice the people that are being successful and the people that are not being successful, it's like – it seems to me that like pursuing your best self is the thing across the board. And mm -hmm. the true pursuit of being your best self, I guess, is up to your own perception of what that means. But for me personally, it's hard not to – like I think that that comes into contact. Like you – so what – overall what I'm saying is this objective known information, everyone has to play with that or they're going to not be respected in the community because respect is – un it, we have to give it to someone so if someone says something that's the truth they they you're like fuck that's the truth you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. or you could say that's not true fuck him no 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 but but if you know it's the <laughs> truth though because you can't help but give respect to someone that's doing the thing in the field like then you become on a negative trajectory yourself and ultimately if someone doesn't want to make that compromise if they're like well i'm not going on a negative trajectory like i know what the truth is now i'm not going to act like i don't know what it is because that would make me not a good human and make me not myself yeah. Like, those people, I think those are the leaders in the community. Those are the people that we respect as humans. Like, those are the people that get to this elevated path because they're being true to themselves and they're playing an honest game with an honest hand. And mm. that's what life is genuine, genuinely about, I think. Mm -hmm. And with that comes the stipulation that you have to play fair with objective information. And that's why subjective information is so fucking lucrative. <laughs> because it could mean anything, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You know, you, the, we're not sure. We're not sure about some things. <clears throat> and we love debating about it. We love uh, hypothesizing and debating or dramatizing, kind of. You know, what I'm saying imagining. Yeah, we like imagining. We love we love our imagination. We let that shit run wild. That's another thing that's <laughs> who doesn't love that. Yeah, if you could sell that to people, mm. that's tight. Rick and Morty sells that to me, and I love it. I love it. it. <laughs> like, I'd pay more for it. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm pay a premium because they really play with my imagination like mm -hmm. they make me fucking think i'm like man you know you just watch portals and time jumps and different universes yeah going through tropotypical things and it just like un it unloops some of your loops and like i'm able to think broader and yeah, like, yeah 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 you know what it, I'm saying? it widen it kind of widens your i don't know what it is exactly scope or reference point of just like thinking about life itself it's, it's, it's very abstract i fucking love love that about that show yeah, super it's abstract. Awesome. Really, it widens your thinking. Yeah, it's and it's more abstract. It's well done too. It's like written in a way where they're going through these like character arcs and like these. They're addressing. I think the people that write it are very aware of like their own like stories and like their own uh, moral dilemmas and their own like tragic things that have happened and their own character arcs that they've had to go through. Yeah, their own life story, and they're able to write that. Not necessarily straight up from their life, but able to give these like – they're tropotypical in the sense where we would – maybe a lot of people go through them in the span of their life. But they're able to draw it out really quickly and like write it really well into the story. Like you see the movie, the one where – I think it's in the most recent season, but like they're doing the spaghetti people. Mm, I don't think so. Maybe. But I don't think so. No, hold on. There's another scene. Um, You, you know when they're doing the fucking uh, – <laughs> the cookies – and it's like the guy's having a moment of pure joy. And, oh, yeah, and they yeah, extract yeah. The feeling. <laughs> that feeling and putting it into a cookie. Yeah. Like the way that it presents that moment of pure joy. And it's just like, you're like, oh my God, like I felt that <laughs> shit, bro. Like their ability to do that is kind of crazy, right? Mm -hmm. But it's something about like emotional intelligence of what people go through and like kind of like tapping into those raw emotions that life will make you have about stuff, you know? Mm hmm. It's like sharing a cookie with his daughter or some shit. Yeah, yeah. They're like after like a long day of like mm -hmm. a good and a bad thing happening, and they're finally got done fighting, and they're like, you know, I don't know what the fuck it is. You know what I'm saying? But it's yeah, real. Yeah. I remember that shit because it's, it's hilarious. Cause, yeah, the first one's like that, and then at the end of it, it's like <laughs> they capture the guy who like 
<laughs> went crazy in his job and like killed his boss <laughs> <laughs> he went postal like for real and they tried to trap him and he's like breaking out and he's like, you're like oh, you made it out you broke out you did it he's like i did it <laughs> like, you can leave you're fine <laughs> and they capture him, like, fucking encapsulate that feeling and put it into a cookie <laughs> <laughs> liberated rick <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah bro it's so funny yeah, yeah. it's so funny so the broad so, so mm-hmm. even what you think is not what you think about what you think like it's doing that to me you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. you're able to like escape some of your presuppositions and your notions yeah and it's a great show great show I love that show man but there's just something to like known information that's kind of crazy because why is that so true <clears throat> it's like because you know i'm like fuck yeah so the, the entirety of science is based on known objective information mm. that's what we're trying to do or mm. that's what the entirety of science is or i guess so there's like uh, whatever like social sciences but whatever i'm like uh more physics and shit, you know? Yeah. Those types of sciences. Yeah. We're definitely trying to study and uh, create concrete, objective reality. Or yeah. scope it out and field it out and map it out. What's going on here? What do we know? What do we know is true, objectively true? And maybe not you're trying to do that, literally you. But, like, mm. as people, like, the mass of people starts to collect data. Like, someone wants to collect the data. Other people are interested in it. They realize it's important. And then they start recording stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Trying to, yeah, trying to map out what the hell's going on here in this 3D matrix that we're in. Yeah, because a compass. What the hell is this? A what com- is this? <laughs> <laughs> what is this? <laughs> what is any of this? What, what was that? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> i'm not sure science was born <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's it especially yeah that's super simple like <laughs> from that moment to figuring out we had oxygen that we breathed mm. in like and i was always like, like how do they know they're right that? <laughs> yeah <sighs> starting from that <laughs> <sighs> what the fuck is any of this it's like, oh. <laughs> got, got hands what is this? We can call it a hand. <laughs> what do I do with these? <laughs> like, there had to be a period of that. I mean, babies do that. You know what I'm saying? They're always experimenting or trying to figure out what the hell's going on. They're always like squirming and moving and kicking their socks off their feet and shit. Maybe it's because at a super like base level, primordial level, infancy level, knowing what's going on around you is like hyper valuable. Like. The most valuable thing. It's like way more important than knowing anything mm-hmm. else is understanding what the hell my feet are. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you can't go anywhere forward outside of this unless you like know what the hell's going on with this at least. Yeah. At least a little bit. At least a little bit. Like just that you have motor function. That you have this. It's like, oh, okay, this is this is mine. Okay. Okay. And then you move forward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess like I don't know. I, I don't maybe like animals just like move. They're not like yeah, we have to deal with being conscious. We're like, oh my gosh, I'm a I'm a person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have people I can trust. Okay, they're taking care of me. Okay, that's tight. That's mm-hmm. tight. Like you just like figuring out what's going on. You know, to figure out what shit is. Maybe that urge is just still in us, like in our twenties and thirties and forties, and it's just like even when what's going on isn't like so right here, it's still like hyper valuable. Mm-hmm. If you know what's going on in the marketplace, if you know what's going on in the world. If you know what's going on in your office. I see what you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. What what uh, circles of information you have? Yeah, information. Everything's information. <laughs> That's no information, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> All it is is information, Joe. <laughs> all telling the same story, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Cat Williams, Joe Rogan. Dude. Cat Williams is awesome. Yeah. Well, I love him. Great episode. Good episode. Oh, man, you wanna want to finish this up and uh, head out to the EM? Oh, it's time. Let's head over to the game. Be played. Oh, brother. I love it. I love it to death. <laughs> Fucking hell yeah. Whatever this pod hits you, I hope you have a freaking great day. Get in there. Whatever you're doing. Get in there with the dishes, the drive, the walk, the run, the lift, the life. Keep on pushing. And enjoy it. Enjoy it all. That's what we're here to do. We're here to enjoy it. It's an enjoyable experience. Yeah. Enjoy the hard work. That's another thing. Ooh. Enjoy the abstract. Ooh. Not, just, you, not just pure joy. But. How you do that? <laughs> <laughs> just go hard. I enjoy going hard. Yeah. <laughs> I enjoy upholding responsibilities. Yeah. 
You got to kind of get off on the savagery of it. Yeah. I'm winning. I'm up. Feels good. Yeah. You can get off on the, like, the objective or get off on, the, like, the ego, like, the subjective. You know what I'm saying? Get mm. off on the objective story of who you are. You know what I'm saying? Mm. It's like watching that movie. It's like, yeah, this movie's good, man. This movie's... It's like watching the montage of Rocky. It's like, yeah, I like watching this motherfucker go in right here. He's finna, he's finna get it. Mm. That's what I'm talking about. I gotta go get mine. I gotta <laughs> go get mine. I love y'all. Make that montage. See y'all next time. Rolling through the city to the light show. Really ain't no telling where we might go. I just flipped the switch. I'm in my